Good afternoon. I'm uh, delighted to welcome Jacqueline Novogratz, uh, CEO and founder of Acumen, to Google today. And in today's conversation, we're going to discuss a whole bunch of topics, uh, but primarily one that I think Jacqueline is really focused on currently, which is around moral leadership. So uh, in the 16 years that Acumen has been around, They've funded almost 100 companies, more than $100 million. They've positively impacted more than 200 million people around the world in some of the poorest parts of the world. And so I have been personally involved with Acumen myself for several years now. And I've always been amazed by the, the thinking and the vision that Acumen has had in dealing with some of the key issues that we all see affecting the world around us. And so I've been proud to be a part of uh, this journey and uh, been a proud uh, supporter of Acumen all of these years. And uh, with that, welcome to Google. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks for all you've done for, for Acumen. Absolutely. Uh, Jacqueline, I thought I'd start off not by too much of dwelling on the past, but now that you have been on this journey, for 16 years with Acumen, and certainly your own roots in uh, the social sector uh, transcends well before that. Uh, tell us about, like, you know, what are you proudest of Acumen having ac accomplished to date? And what are like, some of the learnings from this journey that when we talk about the future, we'll, we'll think through your learnings and like, how they apply to the future? Great, big question. Yes. Um, uh, the Probably the, the biggest, when we started Acumen, um, it was clear to us that markets alone were not going to solve the problems of poverty, nor was charity by itself. And so we had this idea, as you know, of patient capital, mm -hmm. that we would take philanthropy and we would invest in intrepid entrepreneurs for the long term, 10, 12 years, mm -hmm. to disrupt systems. And 16 years later, uh, often credited as being one of the pioneers of the impact investing sector, mm -hmm. uh, I would say what makes us still feel proudest is this recognition that you can use capital as a means to solving problems. We get in trouble if we see it as an end in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, but if you think about it as a means, you can actually build individual companies that can change systems, whether it is taking on the broken ambulance industry in India and now having a company with 3,500 ambulances in 8,000 employees, mm -hmm. uh, has taken 6 million people to hospital, or, um, or Delight, which we were talking about, mm -hmm. which is two guys out of Stanford Business Schools with the solar torch and a dream to eradicate kerosene, mm -hmm. 10 years later has brought light and electricity to 72 million people around the world. Uh, these companies wouldn't have happened mm -hmm. if we had let business be business. Sure. It required some very thoughtful philanthropists to mm. say, take this money, invest, mm. give these entrepreneurs the time to experiment, to fail, to try again. Mm. And lo and behold, we've seen, as you said, 200 million people get access to services mm. and new models for how we solve problems of poverty for the world. Mm. And as you think about then the, the learnings from like this journey that, uh, influence how you're thinking about the future? What stands out for you? So in many ways, we grew up against the global backdrop of the last yeah. 15, 16 years. If you think about it, when Acumen was started in 2001, it was a, the world was a very different place. Mm. Uh, whether you're talking about cell phone technology, uh, post 9-11 versus yeah. pre 9-11, um, and the lack of trust around the world, uh, the inequality that we're seeing, as well as real questions of capitalism that are coming on. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, Acumen has moved from simply focusing on entrepreneurs that are trying to solve specific problems of poverty, Prasad, to uh, where we fit into building an ecosystem that can take on the issues of capitalism, mm -hmm. frankly. Mm -hmm. um, how do we create a more inclusive capitalism? Uh, not just acumen, but the world is starting to see that we must move from shareholders to stakeholders. Hmm. For us, those stakeholders have to include the poor yeah. and have to include the environment. 
the world is seeing that we need a long-term, not a short-term impact, which is something that we have stood for. The world is seeing that we have to start with purpose before profit, mm -hmm. rather than just do good and do well. Mm -hmm. And that we need to define success more than how the rich fare, but mm -hmm. how the poor and vulnerable are treated. And so um, I think that this drive, as we've seen the world move from interconnected to interdependent, allows Acumen to play a very different role on the capital side, yeah. as well as on the kinds of entrepreneurs and the kinds of businesses that will enable a more sustainable mm. world for all of us. Yeah. You mentioned quite a few things that I'd love for us to explore in this conversation. Uh, the, the, the new way of thinking about capitalism, uh, thinking about leadership itself, thinking about the role that technology and the connected society that we have today play in. So I'd love to explore each of those with you. Um, if we start off with like the, the, the broader macro trends, as you mentioned, uh, we do see a lot of changes in the the political nature around the world, and like you know, uh, the forces of globalization that were very prominent over the last 20 years, as well as capitalism being very prominent. How do you see that evolving, and like you know, what role do you think like Acumen and and others should be thinking about as you think about capitalism itself? Well, as you as you're speaking, you know, you you think about how many governments are actually pulling inward yeah. rather than. This is a moment where we need to reach outward, which is something that Google yeah. really represents. Right. The world I get to see and Acumen gets to see is a, the next generation that is looking for new rules altogether. There's so much faith and trust lost in the big institution. Yeah. What's so thrilling to me is to see these entrepreneurs that are, that are using moral, what we would call moral imagination mm -hmm. to build new systems. So an example, two examples, one from Colombia, one from the United States. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at coffee or cocoa for chocolate, these are industries that really were born in slavery and colonialism. Mm -hmm. And the economics of them have not changed all that dramatically. If you think about chocolate alone, there are six million cocoa producers in the world. 90% of whom make under $2 a day. Wow. On the back of that, we're supporting a $150 billion chocolate industry. <laughs> Those economics really make no sense if you're thinking about the farmers that we right. need to depend on. And it should be no secret or surprise that the average cocoa farmer is 58 years old, and most of their children do not want to be farmers. On the other hand, you're starting to see an artisanal chocolate industry <laughs> take off where individual chocolate bars can sell for $12, $15. Mm -hmm. So there's a new generation of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who are completely ignoring global commodities prices mm -hmm. when they are negotiating with farmers. They're understanding the price that farmers, or the cost to farmers sure. of actually producing. In many cases, they're doubling those costs, mm -hmm. but providing a margin that is not 30% better, but 200% better than the global commodities prices. So it's it's left fair trade behind and substituted it with a radical transparency mm. using technology to show the farmers the whole value chain from what they're paid to what these chocolate bars are sold for to enable communities of trust. To me, that is so incredibly hopeful when we think about visibility and transparency around the products that we right. want to buy. And the new generation cares about that stuff. In the United States, Everybody talks about workforce development, certainly in Silicon Valley, as we should. Um, on the other hand, we're not doing the job that we should be doing in terms of getting diverse communities into coding jobs, for instance. We've invested in a company called Learners Guild, just here in San Francisco, that understands that low-income communities, particularly of color, often have huge stress families, jobs that pay $15,000, $20,000 a year, it's impossible to go to a, a, a good coding boot camp um, and stay in your job right. um, and take care of your family uh, so that you can get the job. So what these guys have done is create a system where um, they will give you a 10-month stipend so that you can focus fully on the boot camp, mm. at the end of which you have to pay it back, mm. but only once you start earning $50,000 a year. So mm. there's a risk sharing. Sure. The first batch have just graduated. The average salary 
is 81,000 that wow. these guys are getting. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they came in at an average salary of 23,000. Mm -hmm. So we can do this, but it's not traditional capital that will enable that because there's risk at every level. Right. Then Acumen can play a role because what, focus, what we're focused on is solving the problem, right? Not just right. making money. Right. What you learn is that companies like Google and others in Silicon Valley have requirements for um, college degrees because of H-1 visas. Mm. So all of this stuff is interconnected again. Sure. Many of these communities don't have college degrees. So then we can intermediate and say, wait, wait, guys, to make this system work, yeah. we got to change that. And that's the way we're starting to think about building an entrepreneurial ecosystem that will enable these companies to change the way the world tackles poverty, essentially. Fascinating. Um, as you think about the ecosystem, one part is um, thinking about these problems, thinking about the entire value chain, as you said. Um, then there's a piece about um, just the, the people that you're trying to find and like the, the leadership itself. You've been talking a lot about moral leadership. Like, can you tell us what that means in your mind? Yeah, and again, it's this, this recognition that in going from an interconnected to an interdependent world, we will rise and we will fall together. Mm. And that we can no longer make all of our decisions according to a single metric. And yet, it's a lot more nuanced and complicated when you are making decisions based on multiple metrics, based on multiple stakeholders. It necessitates navigating the gray. So when we think about the qualities of a moral leader versus just someone who can get stuff done right. and is focused simply on efficiency, they are individuals that have what we call a moral imagination or the ability to have the audacity to imagine the future and what could be, but also the humility to recognize the world as it is. Mm -hmm. They are individuals who see capital, as I said, as something that we control rather than let it control us, that see investment as a means, not as an end. Something that we don't think about enough when we talk about moral leadership is grit, resilience, persistence, mm -hmm. courage to fight a status quo. What we've learned is that if you want to build something new, you are going to be fighting a system that does not want to change. Right. And, so, and that system is full of bureaucracy, corruption, and probably the worst of all is complacency. Mm -hmm. So do you have what it takes, mm -hmm. the determination, the persistence? Mm -hmm. So we are increasingly looking for that. Mm -hmm in every entrepreneur that we invest in, as well as the fellows that we're finding. Mm -hmm. Because that will tell us whether their ideas are actually going to take off. Right. Probably just like you at Google, we've learned that great ideas come and yeah. go. But give us the leader yeah. who have what it takes yeah. and to do it ethically yeah. in a world where so many systems yeah. are broken. And what's been your uh, experience, Jacqueline, as you think about um, uh, developing this next generation of leaders? Have you been able to find them? Uh, have you been able to scale how they actually learn and grow and become these kinds of role models for the rest of the world? Any examples, any, anything from your experience you can share? Yeah. Um, in addition to investing in the 100 companies, we've invested in about 400 yeah. fellows across 32 countries. and. You know, we've said it before that, that talent is, is fully distributed across the yeah. world. And um, daily I am blown away mm. by the capabilities mm. of these individuals mm. uh, who really need access, capital, uh, networks. Um, and so yes, we're seeing enormous change happening um, at the company level, whether it, it's someone like, uh, 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 Gayatri, in, who runs a company called LaborNet in mm -hmm. India, which a number of Googlers right. have helped right. uh, and volunteered for. But they've essentially recognized that education in a traditional school room is not going to be the answer to the world's problems, particularly in a country like India, where 85% of the country has not gone past 10th grade. Mm -hmm. And so they've gone, they go into construction sites work with Muslim communities doing beauty salons, uh, leather tanning, and they provide um, workforce development training, mm -hmm. ethical mm -hmm. training, safety training, and then cream those who are clear learners to help them get better and better jobs. And they've already trained 
a half a million people. Wow. So some of these companies are really working at scale. To um, individuals who are just getting started, Waqas Ali is a Pakistani from a small village in rural Punjab, a couple of hours outside of Lahore, Pakistan, who works with local cobblers making beautiful shoes but never had a market. Mm. Um, he worked with other fellows across Pakistan to, re to redesign his shoes, rebrand his, mar his company now called Markor, um, create a Kickstarter campaign, use our network to get those ideas out into the greater world, raised $115,000 on Kickstarter, now is in the Y Combinator, and is on his way to building a company that provides good quality, visible jobs mm. to village men and women, and uh, creates a, an export product for Pakistan that the country wow. should be proud of. Uh, we're seeing this kind of yeah. innovation happening in the, the highest and lowest communities of India and Saudi Arabia, uh, across the world, actually. This, uh, both these examples just show the, the power of uh, connection. How uh, are you thinking about technology as an enabler of these kinds of connections, and what could they possibly do for us in the future? Well, one, we get so many emails from young people who want to start companies themselves. And two, every time we launch a fellows program, we will get over 1,000 applications for 10, 20 spots. Yeah. Um, so we started to ask ourselves essentially this, could we put the courses that we're training our entrepreneurs and our fellows in, could we put them online and would anybody take them? Yeah. And so looked at, well, what are the courses that people care most about? Human-centered design, lean startup, mm. storytelling, uh, that you can't really be an effective leader if you can't tell a story. And um, we've now put about 30 courses up online and we've seen a half a million signups mm. and 300,000 people taking these six to eight week courses where they have to come together in groups. And out of these courses, what's been so thrilling is we're seeing companies being built using these same metrics of moral leadership, whether it's Kidogo, uh, a Canadian and American who met on, online, moved to Nairobi to start a, a nursery, essentially, for low-income uh, little kids, and have now turning it into a franchise and uh, are really growing. Or I just got a note from um, an Indonesian near, named Irvan who uh, took 19 courses, started a company to work with smallholders and really break a lot of the barriers mm. that smallholders deal with in Indonesia. He's got about 300 employees and is ready for a Series B that we're starting to see this entrepreneurial uh, imagination mm. combined with dedication. Mm translate into real change for the world. Can you then build a community yeah. of individuals who are daring to use the skills and the attributes they have mm. to solve big problems of the world? Because that's, that's what we need. We need a right. movement right now. Right. As we see so much that is cynical, lacking trust, because it lacks trustworthiness. Yes. Um, a huge divide between rich and poor, the, the dis destruction of so much of our physical and human environment. Yeah. We need a counter movement that says no. Yeah. What this moment in history offers through our interdependence is an opportunity like humanity has never had in history. Right. That we can work across lines to create the new kinds of companies, the new institutions mm. that allow us to bring our best selves to one another. And what the ecosystem that we're seeing through the fellows, the companies that we've invested, the online community mm -hmm. is showing is just that, that this is a possibility. And it's something that we've got to double down on and really grow. Um, this movement for moral leadership, frankly, and a more inclusive type of capitalism that, that is measured by the amount of human energy we release in the world, the amount of human flourishing and dignity, mm -hmm. not just how much money we make or even how much money we give away. Thank you. That was very inspiring. It was uh, very, very much in uh, synchrony with uh, the kinds of messages that Google and Googlers love to hear about. And we try to live that in our own environment out here. 
Um, the partnership between Acumen and Google goes a long way, uh, certainly, uh, both with financial funding as well as uh, uh, office locations and so on. And, um, and I know that a bunch of Googlers have also worked on some of these projects, including uh, working with LabourNet, et cetera. What message would you have for other Googlers who are thinking about Hey, how can I work in either the social services sector, uh, partner with Acumen itself, et cetera, like any, anything that uh, yeah. you'd like to share? Well, and, and you're right. Google has been um, a critical partner to Acumen from the very beginning. Uh, 2006, uh, Google supported us with a significant uh, grant mm. to really help put Acumen on the map. Um, at that time, we also were given amazing office space mm -hmm. in New York City uh, that lasted nine years. Yeah. And for that, we are eternally grateful. So many nonprofits have to sit, sit away in a cubbyhole somewhere. Right. And having a great location with Google right upstairs enabled real relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and we have huge debt to many of the Googlers, um, Craig and Kirsten Neville Manning, who've become real partners to us, um, Doug Rohde, others, you that really um, supported us in uh, concrete as well as inspirational ways that you probably don't even know. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, in 2010, Google gave us $2 million in philanthropy to do this early stage um, work in solar. At that point, we were taking big bets in off-grid solar where very little was actually known there was no investment, particularly in Africa. Um, most people relied on kerosene, take, buying little bits of kerosene every day, by which they would read at night with a lot of smoke um, and cook. And uh, trying to convert people seemed like it should be yeah. easy, right? Yeah. But the truth is, you have no trust, you have no income, you have no financing mechanism, mm -hmm. and you've never really seen solar work. And uh, it takes a long time to go from a push market to a pull market. And over 10 years, we invested about $20 million of philanthropic capital in these companies. That taught us how people make decisions, how to market in a way that people could hear. It gave time for mobile banking to enable the financing mechanism. We built brand recognition, particularly through Delight. Googlers helped in many different aspects mm -hmm of that building of a value chain that had not existed before. So much so that we were able to take the Google money, leverage it 10 times with the 20 million invested, and now are raising a $100 million for-profit initiative so that we can prove to government that off-grid solar is faster, cheaper, and more effective than extending mm. the grid. It takes $1,500 to get one household mm. connected to a grid. And as they say, nine years to never. And for $170, people can buy a 10-watt system, three lights, a radio, a flashlight, um, cell phone charger, and their life changes overnight because of what they have done mm. themselves. Mm. That is where dignity gets to start. Mm. And we think Africa can leapfrog the grid just like it did with, with cell phones leapfrogging landlines. Googlers helped there financially. They helped in terms of uh, design, yeah. thinking about some of the technology here. Um, when you go to the volunteer work that you talked about, um, many of our companies have tech platforms um, for the work that they do, whether it's a bank in rural Pakistan that has 500,000 farmers and is now converting to mobile banking, or LabourNot, which I was talking about before, or Isoko, which is a platform for smallholder farmers based out of Ken Ghana and now Kenya, to give farmers market information, Google helped actually take that platform and one both propose a million dollar grant, which the company got, as well as help design a platform for mobile banking and uh, the, the distribution of implements. That's a major sure. give for fellows that, I mean, for Googlers who went over and actually spent time in country with, com with companies. So there's real opportunity there. There are 400 fellows mm. uh, that are requiring different kinds of, I don't even necessarily want to say mentoring because so much of them are such great leaders, sure. but certainly technical um, expertise as well as access to networks mm. um, and ideas. Mm. Um, there's real opportunity there. There's opportunities to contribute 
to this kind of work in the building of this ecosystem. We would love to see co-creation of courses. I know that you have mm -hmm. online courses. Mm -hmm. And some of our most successful courses have been co-created, whether it's with Fossil, the company, or IDEO on the human-centered right. design. Right. And so I think that there's a myriad number of, of ways for Googlers to interact with Acumen uh, through the technology, through the know-how, through the networking, through financial support. Fantastic. We look forward to uh, keeping those connections strong with Acumen as we explore the future together. Uh, as I mentioned early on, our, uh, certainly our paths are intertwined. Uh, there's a lot that we collectively believe in, both Acumen as well as Google, in terms of being a positive force for the world, uh, using technology in, to address a whole bunch of problems that uh, have perhaps been neglected over time, uh, thinking about the use of data, which I know is a, a lot of work that you folks are doing, and just getting a lot more rigorous about measurement of impact in the social sector. Uh, so certainly, we we'll look forward to continuing that, uh, that partnership. Uh, one of the other common things that uh, is both of interest to you as well as to us is this notion of diversity and inclusion. Mm. Right? Like that is a big topic, certainly at Google, certainly all over Silicon Valley and, and the technology industry. Um, and uh, I was especially struck by our earlier conversation where you talked about how you're getting groups together of people in this, notion, in this attempt to build a community, people who would perhaps not engage or ever meet or talk to each other. Can you share with us your, uh, both your experiences there as well as your emerging thoughts on how do you get this global community together? Thanks, yeah, this is something that's keeping me up at night and I know it's so important to Google and, and particularly when you look at Google Translate as well as a yeah. way that we yeah. can have greater access to one yeah. another. And I think that that's actually a fifth way that we could yeah. interact with Googlers because our community um, is so diverse. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in one community in Pakistan, there are 73 languages. And many of them are getting lost. How could Google help mm -hmm. to keep those not just claimed and reclaimed, mm -hmm. but alive? Mm -hmm. um, and so what we started to do, um, 10 years ago with the Global Fellows was to bring together people across lines of difference. Mm -hmm. We realized that at a global level so often um, we, we end up with people who are actually more like each other than sometimes they are mm -hmm. low-income people are in their own countries. Mm -hmm. And that if we really wanted to get to diversity, we had to have the courage that you talked about of cutting across all of these different lines that keep us separated, mm -hmm. religion, class, ethnicity, mm -hmm. ideology, geography. And so whether we've started in three regions, Pakistan, India, and East Africa, mm -hmm. and we find um, amazing leaders mm -hmm. across all sectors and all of these different lines. If you take a country like India, which is so vast, right. you have some young Indians that have gone to the best schools in the world and have graduated at the top of their mm -hmm. class and want to use those skills to make change. So Hani Mohan, mm -hmm. um, number, one, number one at the IIT Mumbai, then she went to uh, uh, investment banking and after a few years thought, I'm one of the most educated people on the planet and yet I go to the villages and women have no access to even basic health hygiene. Mm -hmm. And so she started a... Um, uh, a feminine hygiene company mm -hmm. a few years ago and has just sold her millionth uh, biodegradable san sanitary pad mm -hmm. and um, is using the network of fellows to do, to do this. To do that effectively, she's actually got to understand how people in far-flung villages who don't speak her language, who have a different religion, who are in some cases deeply conservative, right. how they think, how they respond. Mm -hmm. And so our fellows program includes people from those villages, but who are incredible fe leaders in their own right. Sure. And we bring them together and both hold up a mirror to them. Where do you get in your own way? Wh what is your identity? How do you think through it? We use literature as a springboard into conversation, using moral leaders yeah. as, as that springboard. Yeah. So they, regardless of where they come from in the world, they will read the same curriculum everyone from Plato and Hobbes and Rousseau to mm. uh, Haldun, one of the great 
uh, Islamic um, mm -hmm. mathematicians and philosophers. Um, they read Haile Selassie and Chinua Achebe of Nigeria, Gandhi, of course, Mandela, King, Aung San Suu Kyi, and, and there's a pantheon uh, of moral leaders who have been engaged in the same conversation for 2,500 years. Mm -hmm. What is the nature of man? Mm -hmm. How do we make trade-offs between the individual, which mm -hmm. we're seeing reigning supreme in Sil Silicon Valley, right. and the community, right. where many of the places that we work takes precedence. Sure. How do you trade off freedom and security at this moment where so many people mm. are afraid? Mm. How do you trade off justice? Mm. Or do you? What's the difference between justice and generosity? Mm. What's easier? Mm. We have those kinds of conversations, mm. stepping back, reflecting, so that you can both understand more who you are and what your values are and the principles by which you live. Because we live in a moment in history where our leaders are flinging opinion at one another. Yeah. They are not standing on principle. They are not helping us make sense of this tumultuous time in the world. Mm -hmm. And we can't wait for them to do so. Mm -hmm. And so by bringing these uncomfortable groups mm -hmm. together and moderating these kinds of conversations, not only can they learn more about themselves and each other, but develop the tools to have difficult conversations across lines of difference and then find their tribe, their real tribes mm. in the groups that are trying to solve the problems of education, regardless if they come from a tribal village of Pakistan or an elite school in India or a slum in Nairobi or a university in Rwanda. That's a tribe because they're trying to solve a problem together mm. or off-grid energy or health care for the poor. That, for me, is so incredibly hopeful. Mm -hmm. And that goes to this idea that we could create a citizen movement that transcends, yeah. but we can't do it if elites are only talking to each other. Yeah. We need to bring people who've never been able to sit at the table right. to bring those voices. We need to stop seeing them as needy and recognize how needed they are. And that requires this moral revolution. We've had the technological revolution. Um, I actually think there's a yearning for a moral revolution. Uh, we just don't know how to do it, and we're mm. not seeing it in our leaders. Mm. But we know that we don't like what we're seeing. Mm. And so how do we develop the new frameworks mm. within which we can all find ourselves? And how do we find a minimum set of values that we can all sign up for and yeah. we can all share? Yeah. Um, that actually shouldn't be that hard to do. Uh, yes. We can't approach each other with fear. Yeah. We have to have the moral courage mm. to, to start by listening. And we can't start by trying to convince. Right. We have to listen in a way that's ready to, to be convinced. Right. Thank you. Uh, talking about uh, courage, one of the things that has stood out for me is uh, how you, as well as acumen, uh, both at an individual level but also at an organizational level, constantly keep reinventing yourselves as well and think about what, what is required, uh, what can we learn from the past, what is required with the environment that we see now. So as you think about parting thoughts for, for this group and anyone who might see us in like the uh, big wide world of uh, YouTube, what, uh, what messages do you have for us? Uh, uh, where, where are you headed, personally as well as for Acumen? Um, well, you started by saying, you know, what are the things that you're yeah. most proud of? And um, as I think, think back to that beginning of our conversation, we didn't start Acumen to prove that with impact investing, you could make money in low-income communities. We started Acumen because we wanted to solve the toughest issues of poverty. That has become a north star for us, a thread. Mm -hmm. That makes courage really easy. Mm -hmm. You know, Nietzsche says that when you know your why, you can, you can bear almost any how. Mm -hmm. You can endure any how. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so as the world has changed, we have had to change to stay true to our mission. And that's 
on the one hand, it's courageous, but on the much larger hand, it's thrilling. Mm -hmm. Because I think that for too long, and certainly in my generation, we divided the world between the do-gooders and the people who wanted to make money. That world doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. One, if we are going to create the world that we are capable of creating, we have to recognize that every single one of us is needed, whether you work in a corporation, whether you work in government, whether you work for a nonprofit in the civil society or a community sure. organization. And we've got to approach each other from a place of building trust, not thinking that I have the answers and you yeah. don't. I'm in the corporate world and I'm efficient, and you're in the nonprofit world and you might have a big heart, but you can't ma manage yourself out of a shoebox. Shoe Obviously, there may be truth for individuals, but there are not truths. There's no capital T truth to that. that so one is this idea of be audacious in the, in the problems that we are trying to change, mm -hmm. but then have the humility to start where you are. Just take a step. I worry with the next generation is there's such a, uh, such a focus on perfection sometimes mm -hmm. that people are too afraid mm -hmm. to make a move. Mm -hmm. Just make a move. Mm. And then once you take a step, let the work teach you. Um, probably the second big parting thought would be that came from my mentor here in Silicon Valley, um, John Gardner. Uh, in this age of celebrity, we so often focus on being interesting. Mm. But people who make change in the world focus on being interested. Mm. Find out about others. Mm. Understand the problem from their perspective. Um, have the courage to fail and then just get up and start again. It's not the smart people necessarily who make the change, it's the determined people. And then find a community, find a tribe yeah. that's willing to stand with you as you stand with the poor and the marginal. Because that can be a lonely journey. Um, it will be a lonely journey at times. Um, you got to be able to find the joy that's inside of it as well. And that doesn't happen by yourself. That happens with the community. And what's been so wonderful and joyful and fulfilling about partnering with, with Google and, and, and with you and the team that you bring is that, like you said, this is a, this is a journey of kindred spirits mm -hmm. that are driven by answering problems, yeah. not by being right. Yeah. And if you can take that kind of attitude um, for the long term, there's not a problem we can't solve. Um, we should be bold enough to dare to end poverty in our lifetimes. Not just a material poverty, but the poverty that's keeping us most apart from one another, certainly in the United States. And that is a spiritual sense of impoverishment, of isolation, mm -hmm. of not counting, of being left out. And that's the one we have to work on the most. And there is no way mm. to work on it than to pursue lives of purpose, of meaning, of taking on the hardest problems that we need to solve and can only solve together. Thank you. Thank you for living that life of purpose, being an inspiration to so many people around the organization as well as your own uh, fellows and universities. Thank you very well, much. Well, thank you. And thank you to, to Google. Yeah. Um, truly, uh, you've been with us every step of this journey. Yeah. And I think we're at a level and a place right now to just go deeper together and yeah. learn from each other. Yeah. And I look forward to that. All right. Thank you, Jacqueline. <laughs>